So it's <laughs> my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Brown, Dr. Peter Brown from uh, Yale University. Currently, uh, he was at the University of Maryland. Um, prior to this, um, overlapping with, I guess, my, my entire tenure there. Um, before I arrived, uh, Peter uh, created the uh, School of Public Affairs at the uh, at University of Maryland. He was also, I think, single-handedly responsible for, for getting Herman Daly to the University of Maryland uh, from the World Bank. Um, he wasn't trying to convince Herman to leave the World Bank, but, but uh, getting him another slot was, was the more difficult uh, part, and uh, Peter was, was responsible for that. Uh, so he's been involved with ecological economics, I think, almost from the, from the, from the very beginning. His background is in uh, philosophy. He has a, a BA from Harvard and a PhD from Columbia University uh, in philosophy. And so he's going to talk today on property rights, <laughs> an integrated evolutionary perspective. Thank you very much, Bob. Good to be here. It's, uh, customary to say when you come to a place like this that it's nice to be here, but it's especially nice to be here because I think this uh, institute and the work that's going on here represents a, a very, very hopeful sign for some fundamental rethinking that needs to get done, and it's uh, one of the uh, very few places that are, that are doing it, so it's really especially great to be here. Uh, I left out the uh, word integrated from the title of my speech when I was uh, getting this PowerPoint ready because I wasn't sure it was integrated, so I'll, I'm going to make... Uh, couple of points uh, about the sort of structure of the speech uh, when I, uh, in, just, in just a second. Um, I should say that, that um, what, what I'm going to say is at once uh, revolutionary and self-evident. So I, I sort of apologize for the self-evident feature of it, but uh, I, I think the, hopefully the revolutionary feature will uh, pique your interest. And uh, I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about the issue of, of whether human beings have property rights in, in the world. And, and I'm, I'm, going to I'm going to try to cast doubt on the notion that the world belongs to humanity and that we may uh, use it the way we wish. So uh, in some ways, I'm not going to talk about the, so much the evolution of property rights among humans as the implications of evolutionary theory and evolutionary biology for the idea that humans have any property rights at all, and try to sort of cast doubt on that in the way it's it's uh, it's usually thought of. And uh, I'm a person who uh, who grew up in uh, southern New England, in uh, Connecticut area uh, before it was uh, basically ruined, um, and uh, lived a lot of my summers in Maine. So the, the notion that uh, humans have property rights in nature was part of the culture I grew up in, and, and part of it was taken as self-evident. Not only did you have property rights in nature, but you had sort of absolute rights in nature. So you could, you could basically do whatever you wanted to with your property. And ideas that I, I've come to uh, think need a little uh, examination, which I propose to do here. Um, so the... Um, Hypothesis I want to demonstrate is that we need a new framework for thinking about the relationship between humans and nature, and that this framework will cause us to think differently about property. And, and I'm making use of uh, ev the theory or perspective of evolution in, in two uh, ways. W one is I I'm simply trying to bring out the uh, metaphysical and theological implications of Darwinism and to show that that has revolutionary impact, uh, a revolutionary impact on how we think about property. And then I want to use some more um, recent findings in, in biology, particularly in the issues of the characteristics of the mental life of non-human species. Uh, some work on, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the title for this. I, I called it evolutionary or behavioral uh, biology uh, to try to, to think hard about what, what it's like to be um, a um, a beaver, for instance, and give some examples of for beavers of what it's like to be a bee, things like that. And and when you think about things from this perspective, I think you get uh, uh, some a lot of enlightenment that uh, you don't from other uh, points of view. And but my my sort of general thesis is going to be that we are in a period of uh, metaphysical overshoot, right? That we that we have a number of institutions uh, of which uh, micro and macroeconomics are examples of of thinking or of or about these institutions. And that the the um, the modern pe the, the people who are modern uh, managers of these institutions, uh, 
Alan Greenspan, uh, everybody knows David Dodge is a Canadian central banker, uh, are in, in fact entangled in a metaphysics of five or six hundred years old, uh, for which there is little or no scientific evidence, and that uh, uh, for this reason these institutions uh, need to be fundamentally rethought, part of which I hope is happening here. So that's a sort of uh, overview of it. I'm going to dr drive this uh, by a, uh, the question of uh, bulk water sales from Canada to the United States. It's a very hot topic in Canada these days. And um, I, I, was, uh, I felt fortunate to find these uh, quotes from some of our political leaders in Canada. And, and if you'll, you'll notice uh, the column on the right, from your point of view, the um, uh, Premier of Nova Scotia, John Hamm, is, is applauding uh, the idea from the Premier of Newfoundland that Newfoundland should uh, sell its uh, water. And, and one of the, uh, Newfoundland's a wonderful place. I've been there twice. It's uh, the great people, absolutely amazing landscapes. Um, but one of the most amazing things about Newfoundland is that all its rivers still reach the ocean, right? which is uh, sort of getting to be a rare phenomenon. And, and you can see that, that uh, uh, Premier Ham uh, thinks this is a lamentable situation, right? that, that, that the water actually reaching the ocean is right? something we should put a stop to. And um, you know, particularly if we could get paid a lot of money to do it, it would be even better. So um, I uh, gratitude to these gentlemen for uh, serving as a foil. Uh, now, um, one of the issues about water is, of course, is that humans didn't make it. Um, the amount of water on the Earth is approximately the same as it was uh, several hundred thousand years ago. It's in different forms, in ice, in uh, liquid form, or in vapor, but the total amount of water is about the same, and nobody can claim uh, to have made any substantial quantity of water. So the question is, how would humans acquire the right to sell water? And I want to try to show that uh, there's no good argument uh, for that and, and to trace the, uh, trace the implications of that. Um, in doing that, I want to, I want to make a little uh, aside here and, and talk about uh, Edward, Edward Abbey, uh, because some of my views are similar to his in some ways. I, uh, he he was, um, wrote the book, uh, The Monkey Wrench Gang, uh, which had been referred to as uh, sort of tract and eco-terrorism. Uh, I'm not a terrorist. I'm actually a, a virtually a pacifist. Right? I don't strike other people in anger or other people's property or any of that kind of stuff. Right? But th there is you know, a sense in which I, I think Abby was right about two things. One is, is there any geographers in the crowd here? There's a new, un oh, great. There's a new unit of distance, right, which I think should be called the Abbey, right, because he had a way of measuring how you know, the distance between southwestern cities. Remember what it was? Or Phoenix to Tucson, right? What's the distance? It's how many six packs you could drink, <laughs> right, <laughs> while you drove, right? Not when you're stopping, that's while you're driving. And, and uh, so, you know, I don't know how many, what six packs it is from Burlington to New York, but I, I think it'd be good not to find out, right? It'd be, it, the, the other thing he did that was sort of uh, funny was uh, he, when he drinks beer, then he throws the can out the window. And uh, because he thought America was getting a little bit too pretty, right? And so, it sort of keeps America alive had to do this. So this is a picture of uh, Glen Canyon uh, Dam. Um, this picture taken by Elliot Porter, published in a Sierra Club book called The Place No One Knew. Another picture of the same place. And, and here, here's a picture of uh, Glen Canyon Dam, and, and there's a picture of uh, this book. Um, and uh, the plan of the, in the book was, if anybody's ever read it, was to blow up this dam. And um, the charge was that that was a form of terrorism. And uh, of course, if you look at it from Abby's point of view, the terrorists were the dam builders, right? because they, were the, they engaged in an illegitimate taking of a special place. Now, uh, I want to go back to this issue of, um, of ownership and sh try to show why Abby's view is actually quite plausible view. Um, but uh, I first want to, want to talk about what property means or what ownership means. Um, I think this is true of all cultures. If you own something, you have the right to re restrict in one way or another um, what other people do on your property. You have a right to use it as you wish. And then you have a right to sell or otherwise transfer it. And what those actually mean, of course, varies by culture, by what the law happens to be, uh, a, whole, a whole variety of things. But each has at least some of those 
some of those elements in it. These are just pictures that illustrate that. If you own something, you can put a fence around it, you can use it, and you can sell it. Um, so the question is, you know, what would legitimate thinking that we had ownership of, of the Earth so that we could sell it? What would, what would legitimate the, the idea that, the, that Canadians could um, own their water and, their, and therefore could sell it? And I think uh, traditionally three answers have been given to that question, two, two of them um, sort of representing very important uh, traditions in Western thought. Uh, and the third, philosophical utilitarianism, is in, is in some ways dependent on, on, on those other two. Um, and the, the three that I, I want to talk about are um, Judeo-Christian Muslim views. I, that's one view. Right? Uh, Aristotelian or Cartesian views or rationalist views. And then I want to say a little bit about uh, philosophical utilitarianism. Is the uh, as paternity over current uh, microeconomics. Um, now, in the uh, so the question I'm trying to answer is what what is it that makes us think we own the earth, right? and that the, there are three different answers here. Um, in the Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition, uh, there's a very strong um, line of thinking that nature um, is, was given by God to man. And it's said uh, many places in uh, in the Old and New Testament, or in the, in the Old Testament. Um, and it's also a feature of the Judeo-Christian, but I don't think this is a feature of the Muslim tradition that um, man is made in God's image. And these have very important implications for how we think about property uh, in the earth. And so I just want to talk about those. This is uh, the, the most famous, uh, most influential writer on the concept of property. In, uh, in the field of philosophy, at least, and with enormous practical implications, was John Locke. Um, he was a, a physician and a, a philosopher, both an extremely well-read, intelligent man, uh, who wrote a, a, a number of books. But the one I'm going to talk about is the second treatise on civil government, written uh, while Locke was a, um, li living in, in exile in Holland, uh, moving from uh, different um, faith houses from one to another. Uh, because he felt that the English king uh, was going to um, try to uh, arrest him and bring him back to England for, uh, for treason. And he uh, was, uh, managed to evade uh, capture. And this book was published in uh, 1690 uh, with this very famous chapter called Of Property. That's that chapter I want to talk about a little bit here. Um, so Locke sort of starts out with the assumption that God gave the earth to human, humanity in common. So all, all persons have a sort of claim to a share, uh, share of the earth. Uh, but Locke wants to come up with a way of thinking within that tradition where people can own private property. So you have to, on one hand, he wants to get from the notion that the earth belongs to everyone to the idea that you can have private property rights in nature. And this is one of the more subtle and sophisticated arguments in the history of Western thought on this subject, and, and an absolutely brilliant uh, piece of argument, although one I think is quite mistaken. Um, so these are sort of the building blocks that Locke has uh, make this theory work. W one is he says that, that we just there are natural rights, that the human beings have rights by virtue of being persons, that we have a right independent of being American or Canadian or English or anything, that being a person gives us rights. W one of those rights is the right we have over our own body, to use our body and, and to do, uh, do what we want with it. And this, this gives rise to what's called the labor theory of property, that you acquire rights in nature by mixing your labor with it. By, so I already own my labor. I, I have the right to spend my time and energy as I wish. So I go out and I clear some land and I convert it into for from forest land to farmland. I can establish ownership I in that way. And uh, Locke was very much uh, insistent that when we establish property rights, we're taking from a surplus in some way. That, that in, in this chapter, he gives the example, I I'm riding my horse on a hot day. Um, there's a stream running by the road. I, I get off uh, the, the horse, uh, give, the, the, uh, give the horse a drink from the stream. 
can anybody object to this? And, and Locke says, of course not, right? The stream's still there. The horse has taken a little bit. It's been good for the horse, but not bad for anything else. And so he says we can take from the commons as long as there's enough and as good left for others, as long as, as, long as there's, there's still a surplus remaining. Um, the, other, the other feature of Locke's assumption, uh, major assumption is that uh, God made man in, in his image, that, that hu human beings are, ha have a sort of special metaphysical or theological status where we're not like other animals. You know, we, we have a characteristics of, uh, that reflect uh, sort of our, our relationship to God that, uh, that other animals don't have. And if you can see in this uh, pictures of Michelangelo, I've done a redrawing of this later in the lecture, uh, by the way. Um, do we, God and we look a lot alike, right? And so um, God's just sort of older and maybe wiser version of us. Um, I don't want to make a, create the impression of uh, religiosity, by the way. I am religious. I do believe in, spiritual, in the spiritual life and in God and so forth. So I'm, well, I'm going to sort of disabuse uh, you, I hope, of certain theological notions. I hope I don't disabuse you of them all. I just want to do a little microsurgery on your theology here, right? Um, so we, we are, uh, this is a key element in Locke's theory because when he says there must be enough and is good left for others, he means, by others he means other persons, right? He doesn't mean other animals, right? He just means other persons because we, we, we define, for the most part, the moral universe. Not, not exactly entirely, but... 99% of the concern that he has is with uh, the morality toward other humans. So we own our, Adam owns his own body. We acquire uh, property in nature by people planting rice, by mixing our labor with uh, the natural world. We're taking from a surplus, plenty of water. You go back to uh, Premier Ham's remarks, right? There's surplus of water in Newfoundland. And there's enough and there's good left for others, right? There's uh, Forgotten, Canada has something like one half of one percent of the world population and something like seven or nine percent of the world's fresh water. So you think there was an enormous uh, surplus. Look at it that way. That's important in uh, historically understanding Locke, who's been happily but very mistakenly appropriated by the right wing, that um, Locke very much thought of natural, of, of property rights as being subordinate to, to the obligations that one had. Uh, under, under natural law theory. If, if you, um, when I was, uh, started to work on Locke oh, 15 years or so ago, I, I read a book I, I can't recommend highly enough by Peter Laslett called The World We Have Lost uh, on um, pre-industrial England, on, on the characteristics of England in the period roughly around 15, 50, uh, 1650 to 1700. Um, and one of, the, one of the chapters in there is called Did the Peasants Starve? Um, and to which Laszlo answers, uh, no, right, they didn't. Um, but they were chronically malnourished. The, uh, there were many years in which there were uh, shortfalls of food in um, particular areas. The ability to move food from one part of uh, the United Kingdom to another was not very uh, good. And so there were uh, periods of, of, of uh, perpetual malnutrition, and pe people were often sickly. The last major plague in, in England was um, 1665, and many of the people who were weakened uh, by uh, reasons of malnutrition and so forth died uh, during that plague. So uh, I think what, what Locke is trying to do is he's trying to come up with a way of thinking about private property that will allow us to avoid these kinds of consequences, right? So, so that we can, we can basically bring, uh, legitimate an agriculture that will be adequate to feed, uh, feed the population. Because Locke says, and he says over and over and over again, the primary obligation we have is what the natural law requires, which is the preservation of all mankind. Right? That's the sort of key, that's the single most important goal. And in order to do that, we have to have an effective agriculture. There are, ver there are a number of passages in the, in the second treatise where he says that he who takes one acre from nature and converts it to agricultural land, gives 10 acres to mankind. Because agricultural land is so much more productive than forest land, for instance, in the terms of the things that people want. 
So take uh, land in the Champlain Valley, for instance, or St. Lawrence Valley, where I live. Um, an acre of, of forest land in, uh, in this area, which is almost none of it left, in fact, I think close to zero, uh, that's uh, in its original state, but still, uh, it didn't produce much, right? Whereas if you convert that uh, an acre to cropland, you can grow corn, and, and uh, you can make bourbon out of corn, and you know, I mean, it's a, it's a much more useful sort of, you know, portfolio, right, uh, than if you just left, left it as, as forest land. And I think this is right. I mean, it's true in terms of, of the productivity for things people want. Land that's converted is, is much more uh, desirable. And so when, when Locke was thinking about North America, he said basically North America is a land of waste, right? Because it hasn't been converted. Right? It's all still you know, in its natural state. And if we could just get it converted to farmland, then uh, we'd be much better off. Um, so this is, I think you can see, is in a way the uh, now centuries-old prescription for the transformation of the Earth, right? Because if, if in transforming the Earth we make the Earth more useful to ourselves, and we can fulfill our God-given obligations to preserve other people and preserve ourselves, then this is what we should do. And this is what we are doing. Okay, so that's, that's sort of one branch uh, for property rights. Uh, second branch is uh, much simpler and uh, slightly indirect. Um, this view uh, comes from, uh, in, in sort of, uh, roughly speaking, the, the, the views of Locke have their origins in, in um, uh, Judeo-Christian thought, and this rationalist tradition has its origins in, in Western philosophy. And the uh, key thing here is, this is a quote from Aristotle, obviously, is that human re re the human race lives by art and reasoning, but we're the only ones who do. And uh, you can't give a lecture of this sort without saying something bad about Descartes, so I'm going to say something bad. He also said some intelligent things, but not very many of them. But um, one, of the, one of the things he says, if, if you're going to cause a revolution, wear a suit. That was one of the best things he ever said, I think. Uh, but his uh, view of the human mind was that uh, it's unique, right? That we're the only thinking animal, uh, the only thinking thing, and that, every, that what characterizes us is cognition, and what characterizes everything else is being extended, right? Like this podium is, is extended. Now, in a letter, Descartes makes a very famous or infamous letter, the claim that an, other, other animals have no feelings. And uh, have no cognition, no no reasons, uh, no, no feelings, and can make no claim on natural resources. So the consequence of this is that that in when you look at the world, there's us and there's everything else, right? And we're the only subject. Everything else is an object. And, and the great the quote I came across just yesterday from Gifford Pinchot, founder of the U.S. Forest Service: There are two kinds of things in the world: humans and natural resources. It's a little simple, but. He said it, right? He's a smart man, too. Um, so the thir third view is um, very derivative, I think, and, and less important in some ways, but historically very important, but, but doesn't that much of an argument in it. Um, that um, <clears throat> it's only human happiness that matters, and we should arrange the world in order to maximize human happiness. The, um, this, the views of uh, John Stuart Mill, Slightly qualified in some places, but the, but the basic idea is that we should arrange the world for the greatest good or the greatest happiness of the greatest number of persons. And Pinchot just adjusts this to say it should be the greatest happiness for the greatest number for the longest time. Right? So he just adds a, we, we should maintain a, a resource base uh, in perpetuity in a way. And this gives rise, I'm not going to come back to this in the questions, but he wants to, this is the, the sort of fallout of this set of ideas is uh, cost-benefit analysis and, and microeconomics, who also take over the assumption that um, uh, it's only humans that matter. It's only who, insofar as other, the well-being of other organisms matters, it's only instrumental to human well-being. So uh, is it true that we're better than the rest of nature? Um, and we have these special rights, and I, I want to show, I think, by very simple arguments that it's not true. 
and then try to show what would be a, a reasonable conclusion. Um, one, one problem uh, that starts right off is, of course, there's no evidence um, that the world was created for man. Uh, the, that we have, you know, the, the findings of Darwinian biology basically say, this isn't how it happened, right? It came, there's a whole other set of events that brought this about. Another way of thinking about this, and the, the, the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition explains the fit between humanity and nature by saying God arranged the world so that it would be good for us, and then we sort of messed it up by original sin, but, but basically the fit between humanity and nature was explained by God's benevolence. And modern evolutionary theory says not so, right? The reason there's a fit insofar as there is one is um, uh, co-evolution and adaptation. And that, that's the story that is a far more convincing story empirically than in the uh, theological story. Um, so there's, there's no reason to, that, that pulls an essential sort of piece out of Locke's theory. Um, there's no um, evidence either that it's only humans that reason. And I, I, um, when I started working on this several years ago, I, I had an uh, opportunity to meet with somebody who's at the uh, primate, I forgot the exact name, of the primate center at Princeton. And, and I asked her, a uh, woman, uh, so what's the best book on animal intelligence there is? And she referred me to this book by Donald Griffin called Animal Minds. In, in some ways, the word animal shouldn't be there, right? It should just be minds, right? Because there's nothing special about them. Um, and w one of the things that's uh, interesting is how alive and well Cartesianism is, in a way. Because a lot of people think that other animals uh, don't think. That the, there's a competing school of thought, uh, well described by uh, Donald Griffin, that says basically other animals are responding out of um, sort of genetic programs or, or um, that, that their uh, behavior is conditioned by, by evolution so that they, they don't, when they're confronted with a, with a, a problem in the environment, they just have to, um, they, they have a sort of a genetic repertoire they can uh, bring in. So this is, um, so there's one, one view says it's a genetic program, the other view says it's a reason, and, and so some people tried to test this and find out which was right. And they uh, received money from the National Science Foundation uh, to do this. The question is, why do beavers build dams? I want to find out the answer to that. And when the, the genetic program answer was, well, they build dams because that's their sort of automatic response to running water. So these guys got a, uh, this was your tax money. They got uh, some speakers and some tapes, and they made sounds of running water in the woods. And the beavers went over and looked, uh, hung around for a bit, and then left. No dam building. So they said, well, maybe the experiment wasn't quite right. So they took a pipe, went to a beaver dam, and drove the pipe through the dam from downstream. So the pipe came out above the stream on the down, downhill side, but stayed underwater on the uphill side. So all the noise was on the downhill side. So they started letting the water out. And uh, the beavers went around to where the water was. And then they went around to the top of the pipe, and they plugged it up. <laughs> These guys are really smart, actually. I've been defeated by them a number of times. OK, then <laughs> they thought, well, maybe we're, the experiment isn't quite complicated enough. So bring it up. And then instead of having the pipe in near the bottom of, of the pond, they turned it up and so that it would say six feet above the bottom of the pond, but three feet below the surface. So still no noise, but all noise is at the bottom. Same thing happens. The beavers go up. Then they go underwater, and they build up a mound. And then they plugged the pipe up with sticks and mud after they built up the mound. So it seems now you can keep, you can rescue the sort of genetically programmed thing by saying, well, they just have lots of, you know, they got lots of repertoire, right? They've got sort of lot, lots of different sort of programs to call on. Um, and they, uh, but one, you know, and, and I, I'm a, you know, you sort of stand in awe of the, sort of, the pardon the metaphor, the wisdom of, met, of evolution. But I don't think there's any way evolution could have anticipated the National Science Foundation, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so I mean, I think it's, it just comes down so hard on the side of the reasoning. But, and, and then, um, so you can say, well, that's just another mammal, you know, so what? And turns out that bees actually are able to communicate 
rather complicated ideas to each other. And there's at least some speculative uh, language in here, which I won't read because I think Robert's looking at his watch. Um, but uh, the bees actually have intelligence. Bees can reason their way through a set of alternatives and communicate those reasons to other bees. Anyway, if anybody in the question period wants me to read that, I, I can read it. It's not very long. Uh, utilitarianism is a non-starter, basically, um, on this question and most others. Um, there's no reason at all to think that pain and pleasure are confined to humans. Um, so, you know, we are um, basically that doesn't get you to the conclusion that, that it's, the world should be owned by humans for our pleasure. Uh, this is self-evident, right? We're part of nature. The double helix, all that stuff makes it even clearer than it was. And I just put together uh, some uh, similarities. Here, here's, uh, some, here's a monkey and a squirrel doing what Locke says you should do, right? It's taking from a surplus, uh, not making anybody else worse off. Maybe not, anyway. And then here are other things that we do that they do, right? Swimming, fishing, things like that. Uh, and the other thing that, uh, go back to utilitarianism, that we have in common with them is that we, we all suffer. We're capable of suffering. So it, you can think now, well, it, it's, uh, what's, what, are there any natural resources at all? I mean, maybe, maybe since all these theories seem to fall apart in some way, maybe there's no, there are no natural resources. Resources and and it was not um, it's a, that's okay with me actually if there are no natural resources right but I am appointed at McGill in the Department of Natural Resources so I, I got to thinking well you know maybe I'm going to argue my way out of a job right so <laughs> I figured out a way to salvage this uh, idea um, and. Um, so I think one thing is already um, a new sort of uh, framework is developing and. and we have um, in the U.S. Endangered Species Act, where our uh, rights are given to other species to have habitat and for, to live in a certain way. Canada has uh, just passed a law that's not as good as the U.S. Uh, law, but still the fundamental point is still there that other species have rights, uh, at least some rights, to live. We have um, some philosophical or, or reflective, I don't know if you're going to call Leopold a philosopher or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, where people are saying, you know, we really have to rethink who we are. It's already underway. That, that book's, of course, over 50 years old now. And um, if you go back to Locke, Locke is really saying that property rights are subordinate to the good of the community anyway. Right? So it's not a particularly new idea, what I'm going to say. It's a very old idea. I'm just giving it a sort of different spin. So uh, the idea I want to uh, defend it comes from uh, Albert Schweitzer uh, called uh, Reverence for Life. And uh, Schweitzer, I think, as everybody knows, was a, um, was a very famous man in, in some ways, um, rivaled maybe Gandhi as the most important figure in civilization in the first half of the 20th century. I was born in uh, Alsace uh, and was a, uh, great, a very great uh, organist, uh, was a good player of Bach, um, was very much interested in the restoration of, of organs in small churches, you know, of uh, historically important. Organ wrote a, a very famous uh, and important book in Christian theology called uh, Search for the Historical Jesus, and uh, was a physician and ran a um, hospital in uh, the Congo called Lam at Lamborghini, and was um, a sort of cosmically intelligent person. Uh, wrote a book called The Philosophy of Civilization, and uh, he was uh, in a concentration camp in Africa during the First World War because he was a, a French citizen and was arrested by the Germans and confined. And his, his view was that, that civilization had become un, unattached from its moral foundations and was, on, uh, was in, in a sort of a pr process of decay, uh, which I, I think is probably right. Um, and it would have been the evidence for that, of course, that he would have brought to the fore was the well, First World War. But you know, between now and then, it hasn't been so great either. Um, so here's what he said about reverence for life. I'm going to read a couple sentences here. Um, he read uh, extensively in the history of Western philosophy and extensively in Judeo-Christian theology. And he said, at least about philosophy, he said, uh, what I read, what I learned from philosophy about ethics left me in the lurch. 
I could find no sort of uh, fundamental place. Then uh, in uh, September of 1915, the following thing happened, which I'm just going to read this few sentences here. Traveling on a barge uh, up a river toward, back toward his hospital. Um, and um, he's, he apparently had to go in a hurry because somebody was sick. Uh, I had been in too much of a hurry to provide myself with enough food for the journey, and they let me share the contents of their cooking pot. Slowly we crept upstream, laboriously feeling, for it was the dry season, the channels between the sandbanks. Lost in thought, I sat on the deck of the barge, struggling to find the elementary and universal conception of the ethical, which I had not discovered in any philosophy. Sheet after sheet, I covered with disconnected sentences, merely to keep myself concentrated on the problem. Late on the third day, at the very moment when, at sunset, we were making our way through a herd of hippopotamuses, there flashed upon my mind, unforeseen and unsought, the phrase reverence for life. The iron door had yielded. So I want to try to lay this, uh, carry this idea a little bit further and uh, show what it would mean for thinking about natural resources. Um, so follow so far, by the way, just to make these points. There's no definitive boundary between humans and the rest of nature. Give me the five minutes time. OK, well, this is a, just a quote from Schweitzer that, uh, to this effect. To re respect everything that has the will to live. And um, act with compassion. Skip over that. All resources are, are used. OK, so how would we go about using them? And here, I can, I'm just going to try to. What actually happens if I go six minutes? I mean, we get up and start swinging. Nothing happens, right? <laughs> it's pretty tough. I don't know. I'll be careful. Um, OK, here's, a, here's what uh, principles of reverence would be. Uh, one is um, we need to have a broader conception of rationality. I'll just go, I've got slides on each other. I'll just go directly to the slides. One is that the burden of proof has been shifted. If you want to fool around with natural resources, you have to show why not only it's in the human well-being to do this, but, why, but how it reflects on and how the well-being of other species are protected. We have to recognize that uh, there's a tragic feature that killing and resource use are unavoidable. Um, it's my view that, that the uh, concepts we need to, to defend this uh, view and to, to give it substance are, are not at all found in the Western tradition, and, and they're certainly not found in the uh, in the um, language of instrumental rationality in which we try to conduct uh, modern public policy making. Uh, we need to learn a lot more about the subjective lives of other species. We, we don't know much, partly because we didn't think there was much to learn. It's sort of like an atheist going to theological school, right? There's no point in it because there's nothing to study. And since we assumed for a long time they didn't have a mental life, there wasn't much reason to think about it. And then we need to have a. Uh, reordering of the virtues. We need to enter into a period of atonement, but we really have um, been out of order for quite some time. And then we need to give uh, some thought to prophecy, which I'll talk about at the very end. I'll consider some objections, and then uh, I'll, I'll stop. Well, one objection is, well, it's too radical, right? Nobody thinks what you think, right? That, that everybody thinks something different. And you, th you, Brown, and a few nuts that are around you think this. Uh, but you know you're out of step, right? It, it can't be that you're right and they're all wrong. Right? Um, and so my answer to that would be, well, it's not me that's out of step; it's them, right? I mean, my, my views are are simply I'm trying to draw out the metaphysical and theological consequences of widely accepted views uh, about the nature of human origins, and to show that if you take those views seriously, you have to really revise the picture of, of who we are. It's a picture of one of my friends. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, you, you could say that um, it's too vague, right? With reverence for life, we don't know what it means. Sounds great, but it's sort of like a warm milkshake, you know. After you start tasting it, it's not really so good. I'd like to give an example of this. Uh, I had a former uh, friend in the state of Maryland. I, I went to visit him, and he was going to leave uh, for three days, about an hour before I was leaving. So I said, um, he said as he's leaving, he says, well, we'll leave the light on. We have on the porch. I said, well, why? He said, well, when I get back, I, I, I don't want to have to come back in the car in the dark. So it was about 15 feet from where he parked his car to the porch. And I said, you could leave your lights on, and then you could 
Go back and turn your lights off. Leave the light on. I said, no. I'm not going to leave the light on. If I leave the light on, the moths will batter themselves to death for three nights. And you can just get out of your car and walk around. So I thought I have a former friend in Maryland. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Um, so um, people are dying. You say, well, what's, shouldn't we really make people first? I think we shouldn't make people first, although I think people are important. And we could certainly reallocate resources from frivolous uses to reduce, uh, I think 6,000 people a day die from um, polluted water. Uh, we don't, there's no reason to continue that. And my, my views uh, in terms of respect for life would, would further uh, efforts to uh, reduce that. Here's an example of how we use water now. Uh, this is uh, Las Vegas, it's a fountain in the desert. It's, uh, Las Vegas, the mayor of Las Vegas is a former classmate of mine from the Quaker College I went to, named Oscar Goodman. Uh, was uh, made most of his career defending the mob successfully against the U.S. government, and then got tired of that and went into politics. Um, and uh, here, here's, here's one of the projects in Oscar City. Um, and here, here's, the US, here's an example of U.S. water policy. Uh, this is uh, somewhere in Virginia, I'm imagining, or formerly nice places. And um, this is uh, land that is a 40, uh, 40 inches a year of rainfall, a benign, moist uh, climate ideal for agriculture. This is, uh, I think it's in eastern Washington or Montana. This is drawing down on aquifer. Um, that's sort of, um, well, it's self-evident. It defies a positive description. Um, when the uh, U.S. Uh, comes to Canada and asks for a diversion of rivers or other things like that, I think the answer that Canada should give is, sorry, we have no surplus. All our land is, all our water is used for reasons I've already given. Uh, you had a good situation, you blew it, work it out on your own. Um, and uh, the next to last objection is uh, ethics doesn't matter. You know, you can make all these arguments, but nobody really gives a damn, right? It's uh, the world's ruled by money and by the dollar and the sword. I just came up with some examples where I think ethical arguments have, have made uh, a very important difference. They're not all, well, none of these are perfect outcomes, but, but they have uh, reshaped uh, civilization in important ways. And uh, here's an example of a, of a Emancipation Proclamation uh, issued by Lincoln uh, right after the battle at uh, Antietam, soon after the battle at Antietam. Um, and there lots of things went into this. It wasn't just ethical reasoning, but I think ethical reasoning was important to it. Uh, I'm going to skip over that in case I get cut off. I can come back to that. There's a Michelangelo sort of redrawn. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> not as pretty as his picture, but it's more true. And then um, I want to just tell a little story about Lincoln. No, I'll stop. In um, Lincoln Park in Washington, just east of the National Capitol building, there's a, uh, there's a kind of park that's, a, that's, surround, that's a, where uh, East Capitol Street would be if there wasn't a park there. There's a statue of Lincoln. Uh, with, uh, which had been, uh, don't, it's a bronze statue, very moving. Uh, statue, been given, um, been created by money given by slaves who'd been freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. And it shows Lincoln standing there and it shows a slave, former slave rising with uh, shackles uh, still on his arms, rising up, sort of looking up toward Lincoln. And, and I think sort of we have a, uh, that's sort of where this should be now, where, where this civilization should be, is that we, we have another emancipation. Um, I've tried to give reasons why we should do it. It's a big project. Um, but it's well worth doing. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. And uh, so if you have questions, we can pass those to the, uh, to the aisles and we'll go and collect them. The collectors are out there. And while we're doing that, there's some copies of uh, Peter's book up here on the front, which uh, she wants to sell. Uh, although I'm not sure.
process. And um, there have been several questions submitted over the web on, on the reading of the okay. And uh, <clears throat> this also allows, uh, I think, a, a wider spectrum of questions than what the students will do to sort through those and, and tell you how many times the same question is being asked. So you get a good report. Yeah. <laughs> Not only the, the frequency of it, but very Housing is what I, I call, and it's called in the literature, an extension theory, <coughs> where um, I basically um, sort of we we have evolved a, a moral system, which is what widely accepted in the kind of, the kind of culture in which we're talking now. Um, I think moral systems are evolve themselves; they're, they're part of a sort of evolutionary process. Um, and what we have to work with now is the moral system that we've got. We can't sort of, there's no way to sort of step out of where we are and sort of start something completely new. What I'm trying to show is that we haven't got the ethical system bounded correctly, right? That we, that we think of it as applying only to persons where it should apply to living things generally. Um, so we are in a way taking the tools we've already got and using them in, in new ways and in, in, a, in a sort of new area. So roughly uh, the situation we're in Let's see, I'm going to call this normal morality. What I'm saying is, you know, or, or Schweitzer saying is uh, reverence for life, right, means that this is, the, this is the moral boundary and the characteristics of this space is what we need to fill in. And much of what we've got in customary morality will be useful in describing what, what fills in this space. There's a section in the book called Construction of Difference where I don't think we owe the same thing to all living things. That, that would be absurd. We don't owe the same thing to all living persons, right? Uh, um, but we owe th things to people or to other living things based on what their characteristics are, right? So if, if you have a certain grade point average and certain um, test scores and so forth, you get admitted to the University of Vermont, right? Because you have certain characteristics. You get treated in a certain way. Other animals should, who have certain characteristics should get treated in certain ways because they have those characteristics. So for, for example, in uh, the industrialization of animal agriculture, the well-being of, of other animals, of, let's say, I, I read a book a couple years ago, I can't remember the name of it, wasn't this, it was sort of How to Raise a Pig, and, uh, but it was some science book, you know, so it didn't have that title. I was trying to figure out whether there was any concern with the well-being of the pig, and I was not able to discover any. Uh, it turns out if the pig is unhappy, they don't gain weight quite as fast, and therefore the farmer should be concerned with that. But in terms of the well-being of the pig, it's not, not relevant. Uh, but we know that pigs have mental lives, and the pigs experience boredom, and, and many of the emotions that we experience. Uh, but we don't take that into account in how we treat them. Is territoriality common in species a form of property rights? If so, are not human property rights institutions also natural? Um, well, sure, there is territoriality among other species. Um, I don't think there's any, I mean, there's nothing in the theory that I'm espousing that says human beings shouldn't use the world. Right? It just doesn't, it doesn't mean that we use it exclusively. So you know, we, that we um, appropriate um, things for our use is not ruled out by this theory. It's just put into a different framework. The 
this is a question from the readings. About three or four people asked a similar question. One could view a paradigm shift towards reverence for life as a shift to mass morality. How would mass morality be achieved in place? Sorry, a shift what? A shift towards mass morality. Don't get the word right. Mass morality. Mass morality. Sorry. How could mass morality be achieved in places where religion dictates dictates morality? What about places where religion plays a lesser role? Do you understand the question? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I know the answer or not because I don't know what the question is. Can you explain the question to me? Um, I think where they're getting what they're getting at is can religion be used. Um, kind of as a means, if it's based in morality, or based in like our beliefs, right. can, can that be used um, as a way to shift our paradigm? Um, can it be used as a way to okay, yeah. environmental protection or something else? Uh, well, yeah, so the, the question is, can what's the role of religion in sort of making the transition I'm talking about? And, and I, I, think it's, um, I think it's a powerful role. Uh, that it has, a, a re-envisioning of, of our place. I, I, don't, I don't feel, as I, I said uh, myself, my art, I don't think my arguments depend on this, but I, I, I'm a religious person. I, I, don't, I don't think religious beliefs are absurd or stupid or anything like that. I think they're essential to a proper understanding of human place in the world. So I think they're important. I, I, don't, I do think that the charge brought against uh, Judeo-Christian uh, tradition by Lynn White in the infamous article, or famous or infamous article in the 19, late 1960s. It was in Science on um, what was called the historical origins of the ecologic crisis, I believe, um, is more or less on target that there are elements in Judeo-Christian thought that lead one, for reasons I gave when I talked about Locke, down a path of, of um, doesn't respect other life forms adequately. There are other elements in the Judeo-Christian tradition that do. Uh, for example, in a in, uh, uh, passage in, in Genesis where um, man, uh, human, humanity is charged, uh, go, for, uh, go forth and uh, be, be fruitful and multiply, uh, right before that, God gives the same commandment to the other species, um, so uh, to the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. So I, I think that, that there are elements within the Judeo-Christian tradition that, that will, will work in this direction. but. There are also elements that, that work against it. It does have a nice comment, though, on, on endangered species legislation, because uh, that passage in Genesis, because it does suggest that there's something the matter with endangered species legislation. It's always sort of, well, wh why should we be able to drive them into some small little remnant, right, and then be satisfied that we've done enough, right? Because what, what the passage from Genesis is referred to implies is that, they, that we should seek a world in which the other species are plentiful and, bound, and bountiful. Right, so not, not some other, not, not a world in which we've reduced them to sort of uh, absurdly small um, numbers just above the, the threshold of uh, where they can reproduce. Sort of headed in a, I mean, it's, it's better to have the endangered species legislation than not to have it at all, but it's an absurd way to think about the world that we should, we should dominate absolutely everything except a few remnants. We just got another question from the audience. Are there substantial differences between the U.S. and Canada in their approach to property rights? Are there other countries that now follow, in your view, a better approach to the relationship between human beings and natural resources in terms of how they construct property rights? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure I can answer it very well. I don't think I understand Canadian property rights law very well yet. Um, in general, uh, Canada, the uh, very uh, bizarre, right? Um, Canada is owned by the Queen, um, so it's called Crown Land. And, and in um, exactly what that means, I'm not sure I know, right? Because I don't think the Queen thinks she owns it, right? It's just a, it's a sort of uh, anachronistic expression. But but what it means is that the public owns the land in a way. And in the province of Quebec, where I live, 90% uh, of Quebec, I believe, is owned by the government of Quebec. Um, the um, in, and even if you're a private landowner in Quebec, as a private landowner as I am, you're, you're, uh, you basically have a leasehold in, in a sense, right? You're, you don't own in the same sense you would own if you own land in Vermont, right? You're, you're more, uh, you, have, you have a set of privileges that are sort of conveyed by the deed, but, but there's no sort of a sense of entitlement over the land in the, in the strong sense there is in the United States. I, I think the, 
and I just don't know about the more English-oriented uh, provinces, but the or provinces that are, that are uh, of a French heritage have, have this feature, and, and what, whether I think it's less true in Western Canada, but not well informed. Um, countries that have better uh, relationships uh, between humans and nature, well, what part of it is, is not having too many people. Um, I mean, countries in everything else being equal with smaller property, uh, smaller populations tend to uh, be in better balance. Um, well, one of the uh, many alarming things about the United States is it's headed for a population of 450 or 500 million, uh, at least. Uh, this seems to me to be highly undesirable. Um, but uh, it's, fortunately, I don't live in the United States, so I can say it. I'll be leaving you know, shortly. Uh, but it's not something you're supposed to talk about. But just too many people. I mean, I don't. They're all great. Let's suppose every one of them was great, right? Just every one, just sweet as they could be. That's still a lot of them, right? Many struggle with the idea of stewardship in our national parks in the U.S., which are common goods that belong to us all. You suggest in the reading that private property is alleged to be the best way to conserve resources because it avoids the tragedy of the commons. Do our national parks need to be privately owned in order for true stewardship to occur? These are very good questions. Um, on the, um, I, I think there's a, a, a pure, a, an institution of pure private property rights. Uh, let's say Houston is not what we're looking for, but a system of public ownership isn't what we're looking for either in the main. And because I, I think the criticism that the right wing, um, let's say Pacific Research Institute, places like that, have brought against uh, public ownership, they have a lot to them. Public Public agencies are often sort of captured by the groups they're, they're supposed to be regulating. And you know, there's a lot, lot, lot of problems of having the right information at the right time. All, all those sorts of criticisms that they make about public ownership, I, I think, have some weight. Um, the, uh, and it's certainly true of the forests of Quebec right, are, are now undergoing very, very heavy cutting um, because the province uh, is, is very much uh, in cooperation with large lumber companies. I'm not saying it's all wrong. I'm just saying it's happening. Um, I think the best kind of a property system is a, is a system which has private property features to it, with a private, but within a regulatory framework about what private property can do. And probably um, Vermont and maybe one or two other states are examples of, of a way to sort of strike a balance between sort of public regulation and, and private ownership. The Locke's arguments in favor of the private ownership of agricultural land I think are correct. They've been they've been demonstrated historically that private privately owned agricultural land, under the right sort of technical basis, with a you know with a <clears throat> land grant or something like a land grant system of education and innovation, it is enormously productive by institutions. There's no way around that. Should people be able to do anything they want to with their property? I, I think not, um, for some of the reasons I gave. It's kind of mixed. System. They're strong. I, I don't think there's any that, that in Locke's original conception, private property came with strong stewardship duties. And I have the same view that you ha if you own property, you have strong stewardship duties, but they're not only to other persons, but they're to the life forms uh, that live on that property. And my, I have a farm in Quebec which has rare, uh, rare salamanders on it. And I, I'm working with the Nature Conservancy to uh, be able to continue to farm this as a tree farm, but in a way that respects the habitat needs of, of these rare species. I, I think that kind of thing can be done. Um, can, it, to some degree, if you keep the total consumption level low enough and the total pop human population low enough, you can have it both ways. How do we further the idea of commonwealth in a human-centered world that is rampant with discrimination and intolerance? How do we radically change that society to one where all humans, plants, and animals are rightly valued? What actions could function as stepping stones to start that change? Um, well, hopefully giving a talk like this is help, right? Gets people to think. Um, some of the things are already starting, right? So you, I mentioned uh, some of the legislation that's out there, the um, various societies for the protection of uh, prevention of cruelty to animals are, are, are steps in the right direction. Um, 
Yeah, veg, most of my students that I teach at the School of Environment are uh, vegetarians uh, for uh, moral reasons. Um, so it's, it's out there. I mean, it's, it's by no means um, sort of a, caught a wave, to say the least, but um, it's out there. Um, I don't really know. I mean, I, I think that my own view, which is, I talk about in the book but didn't talk about today, is that, that the macroeconomic system needs to be very fundamentally revised. And that, that the, the, the go just to say a sentence or two about that, that the goal, the, the goal of, of macroeconomics, put very simply, is economic growth, full employment, and low inflation. That's sort of, the, everybody says that. I think it's great to have low inflation. I think it's great to have high, high employment. Um, but I don't think economic growth is an intelligent objective, and that's probably been covered al already uh, here. The, the goal of, of um, the, a goal, not maybe the goal, but a goal of macroeconomic policy should be to preserve ecological resilience, right? So that, so that we, we have an economic system that doesn't sort of overwhelm the ability of natural systems to continue to operate. It doesn't mean we shouldn't alter them. We can't avoid altering them. But it does mean we shouldn't sort of obliterate them, which is to some extent what we do do. So, I mean, I think that's why I said what I said when I first got here. I, I think this institute is a, a place where I'm not saying people come out agreeing with me. I'm saying it's a place where the fundamental rethinking that needs to get done, I hope, is happening. I mean, I think it's happening. If it's not, you should give the money back. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is a question from the reading which we had quite a few people ask a similar question. Our intelligence and our inventions do give us the power to influence other species and exploit natural resources to a higher degree than other organisms. Do you agree with this? And if so, how does it fit into the argument for a on life forms? Well, I don't, um, human beings are, I mean, it's a question of what better means, right? Um, humans are better at making um, CD players. They're better at, uh, I don't think there's any reason to think that oysters can solve differential equations. I can't solve them either, to tell you the truth, right? And I don't really want to either, for that matter. But, uh, but um, you know, there are lots of different forms of excellence, right? What about running, right? Well, we don't, we don't stack up very well against a cheetah uh, or a giraffe, right? Or what about hiding in small places? We don't stack up very well against cockroaches or mice. Right? So there's lots of different ways in which excellence is expressed. We're, we happen to be good at certain sorts of forms of mental manipulation. It's okay, provided it's used responsibly. Um, I, I don't think, I, 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 I'm not a sort of bio-egalitarian in a sense. I think every animal should be treated the same. I, I don't think all people should be treated the same. It's just a question of what are the relevant differences. Um, so that's how I would handle that. I got another question from the reading. Maybe about four or five people asked something along these lines. Um, preserving the environment for a future sounds good, but from the perspective of someone who makes their living through natural resource exploitation, say a water, how do we convince these individuals that the concept of a commonwealth with greater goals of stewardship is important for them? Well, I, I don't think. Um I guess I would go back to the answer I gave a bit ago. I, I don't think there's a, there's a, there's no way to live on the earth without altering it. There's no way to have paper and things like that without cutting down trees. Um, many people, including myself, like things like this, like the uh, wood and natural wood. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of the scale of the activity and the characteristics of the activity. The uh, Conservation fund up around uh, Island Pond, Vermont. They, there's this large uh, preserved area. I think it was bought from Champion. Anybody know this? Um, I don't know that the arrangements are perfect, so I don't know enough about the details, but the concept at a, le at a relatively general level is good, that you, you put on certain restrictions on the use of land, but you continue to use it as a working forest. Um, you can't have it both ways in the sense of um, um, you know, people consume large amounts of paper and large amounts of lumber. Um, and if you're going to do that, you have to get it somewhere. So the closing down logging jobs by itself isn't a very intelligent thing to do. It's a question of how it's done and, and characteristics of stewardship. It's not a question of whether to do it or not. This is a question from the audience. Are you familiar with Peter Singer? Yes. 
Um, that he's an ethicist at Princeton University. Do you feel your views of humans in relation to animals is similar to his? I don't know. I've read some of his stuff and I know him personally. Um, he got into hot water over the issue of whether human beings are intrinsically better than other animals in some way. Right? And my answer to that is no. I mean, I don't, I don't think human well-being always should take precedence over the well-being of other species. I'm perfectly willing to bite that bullet, but I, I don't know. Peter's a complicated person. He said lots of different things. And I, I don't, I'll just avoid that. <laughs> I've already probably hung myself. I'll be deported by the end of the afternoon anyway. So. This is a clarification question from the audience. Is there any difference between reverence for life and the precautionary principle broadly defined? Um, I don't know what to, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, probably, I, I don't know what to make of the precautionary principle, to say the truth. I, I know a lot of people think there's a lot there, but I'm not sure. Um, because I, I, the precautionary principle has to tell you what it is that you're trying to sa save, right? So, so you could say, well, let's, let's take the um, issue of, of the closing of the ground fishery in Newfoundland. Okay, well, the precautionary principle would say in the, in the early 90s, it, didn't, it was very unclear what was likely to happen, but it looked like the fishery was going to go down, which it did. So one, one way to invoke the precautionary principle would have been to say, well, okay, now we're going to cut, cut, shut down the fishery. Because if we don't shut it down, and by the time we wait for all this information to come in, it may be too late. Okay, so the objective there is to preserve the fishing stock. But if I was a Newfoundland fisherman, I could have invoked the precautionary principle, it seems to me, in another way by saying, well, it's my job, right? And, and you know, if, if we close down the fishery, then I lose my job now, right? And the object in, in mind should be the preservation of my lifestyle. I mean, not in the pluralist sense of lifestyle. I don't think the precautionary principle, there's a long history of, of uh, attempts to come up with one or two ideas that are um, as, as decision rules, which this is one. I think they almost all fail. The principle of utility was one, cost benefit analysis was one. They all sort of fall apart in one way. Because it's got to be connected with some sort of metaphysical view, right, about what's the good. Right? And then we're trying to preserve that which is good. And then it's reasonable to be cautious with respect to preserving the good. I'm all for that. Right? But the cautionary principle by itself, without some sort of metaphysical underpinning, I think is kind of a loose cannon, actually. Density maybe comes from evolution, but it can be managed socially. Some societies reward that, some societies don't. The second part was, are we recognizing our dependence on other species and overcoming an evolutionary drive for some promotion? Recognizing our, yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is make us different. Um, well, the question is, is there any difference that's sort of anything that's sort of uniquely different about humans? That's, that's a, I think that's what's buried in that question. Um, it's, it's possible that, that you could say we're the only species right, that cares about other species. All other species only care about themselves, right? and that makes us, that, that's the unique feature. I actually brought some empirical evidence on that point. <coughs> I 
came across this book. Uh, it's called Our Peaceable Kingdom. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. So I've got it at a used bookstore. It's got all kinds of pictures of, of cooperation between different. I just happened to open this page. Here's a, a bear helping somebody push their car that's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, right. Uh, here's somebody that's gone fishing, and an elephant came along to help out. <laughs> This book is full of things like this. There's lots of cross-species affection right? and care, care across the species boundaries. I don't think it's unique to us. Now, it could be that you know, we're the only species that has the sort of cosmic point of view in a way, right? that we can sort of look at the whole Earth in a way and say, yeah, this is the thing we're supposed to care for. I mean, I, I, that probably is. I, it would be surprised if other species did that. But again, it, it, isn't, it isn't just uniqueness that matters. It's that it's that, that uniqueness is then the grounds for moral privilege. And I would say even if that was unique, I wouldn't say that's a ground for moral privilege. That's a ground for moral duty. In determining our approach to environmental protection, should we take a positive approach, focusing on what we can gain from protecting nature, what we'll take away from it? Or should we have a more negative approach, looking at what we might lose if we don't protect it? What do you think is more productive? Well, both uh, a, one of uh, my uh, co former colleagues at uh, University of Maryland. Is, is Mark Sagoff speaking in this series? Is Mark? Mark used to take a lot, do a lot of work on, on trying to show why uh, the reasons offered for environmental protection weren't, weren't adequate. We really had to get to some sort of moral re-envisioning of things. I mean, I'll take all the help I can get, to tell you the truth. Right? So you know, I welcome all arguments that that, I mean, I, I try to frame things in a particular way that I've described here today, but you know, it's um, I think we're we're sort of on the ropes, and I'll, I'll take any help I can get. 